Good afternoon, everybody. A little bit of a little bit of feedback. Hope that everybody is enjoying your lunch. On behalf of the Council of Global Affairs, I'm thrilled to welcome Admiral Cecil Haney, Cecil Haney to our platform today. Strategic deterrence is a concept. Okay, thanks. Strategic deterrence is a concept that most of us have grown up with during the Cold War as nuclear weapons were used to maintain an effective, albeit tense, balance of international security between America and Russia. I think many of us first learned about it when we heard about the concept of MAD, which wasn't our professors talking about us, but really mutual sure destruction. In recent years, the viability of deterrence as an effective concept for maintaining international security has been challenged. It's been argued that nuclear deterrence does not work in today's international threat environment, which is marked by unpredictable and often reckless terrorist groups, an increasing number of countries with nuclear capabilities, the growth of regional arms races and tensions, and threats in unfamiliar domains, such as cyberspace and space. Yet state actors continue to invest and to modernize their nuclear arsenals. As we saw in January with the announcement that it successfully conducted a hydrogen bomb test, North Korea continues to have serious nuclear ambitions. So what does modern day deterrence look like? How has the concept of strategic deterrence evolved since the Cold War? I'm looking forward to hearing more about these topics as well as some of the major threats we face today from our guest, Admiral Haney. First, I'd like to introduce him to you a little bit. Admiral Haney is the leader, steward, and advocate of our nation's strategic capabilities. In that capacity, he has a responsibility for space operations, global strike, analysis and targeting, and global missile defense. That's a big portfolio. Additionally, he has a responsibility for joint electronic warfare, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, cyber command, and combating weapons of mass destruction. And in addition to that, he's a happy grandfather which may be his toughest job. <laughs> Before taking over the Strategic Command in 2013, he was the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, deputy commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, and a submarine commander, among numerous other roles in the Navy and the Department of Defense. He's a recipient of numerous awards, including the Navy Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, and the Legion of Merit, among others and he holds master's degrees from the National Defense University in the Navy Postgraduate School. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Admiral Haney. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And uh, thanks, Mike, for uh, that great introduction. And uh, it's just fantastic to be here uh, with the council. I'm uh, sorry I missed seeing uh, uh, Miss Pamela Scholl, uh, mainly because I wanted to hear her sea stories because I heard she had gone underway on the uh, USS uh, Bush, one of our aircraft carriers, and uh, was really fired up after visiting that carrier and getting out to sea on it. Uh, so it's always neat as a naval professional to be able to uh, talk to folks that perhaps aren't as many years in the profession but are just as fired up. So that's good. I hope I'll have another opportunity sometime in the future. I want to thank also uh, Ambassador Dalter uh, and the Chicago Council Global Affairs uh, at large for your continued efforts in engaging the public in raising awareness on global issues. U.S. Strategic Command provides strategic capabilities to the warfighters, tackling some of these global challenges. And I'm honored to have this opportunity to share with you some of what our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and civilians are doing for our nation 24-7. Chicago has an incredible history, as you all know, associated with our nation's military, particularly our Navy. Now, me being stationed in Omaha, Nebraska, for the second time in my career, I can assure you that Offutt Air Force Base is about as far away from the seaways as a sailor can get. 
Uh, therefore, it's great, though, to be in this uh, great Navy town of Chicago on the shoreline of Lake Michigan, even if the water is not as salty enough for a submariner like myself. Having visited Chicago uh, numerous times and uh, the Navy's only boot camp just north of here at Naval Station Great Lakes, I know how supportive the local communities are to our young sailors. For many of our newest sailors, Great Lakes Boot Camp is their first home away from home. Programs such as Adopt a Sailor provide a welcoming uh, respite during major holidays. And I, think, uh, I want to thank our local communities here and the families for their efforts to make Chicago home for our military members. It's not just boot camp, of course. There's Navy Pier, there's Admiral Jaime G. Rickover Naval Academy, and the high school and college ROTC students that uh, Fireman, Fire Commissioner Jose Santiago and I had the pleasure of addressing this morning here, about 300 some students. So I wanna first publicly thank all that you do and you continue to do to support our joint military force. While I have some prepared remarks, I am uh, very anxious and interested in your thoughts and your questions today. You've already provided me some here, Mike. Uh, thank you. But with all the executive brain power we have assembled here, perhaps your questions will prime the pump for me as I get ready for tomorrow's event. I'll fly tonight to Washington, D.C. Uh, for a hearing with the House Armed Services Committee for Strategic Forces. So uh, looking forward for you helping me with that priming. So this afternoon I'll give you an overview of U.S. Strategic Command's nine mission areas and my six associated priorities and why they matter here in this windy city. Before I do that, I thought I would share a few of my thoughts on the strategic environment and how U.S. Strategic Command fits into that picture. The global st strategic environment today is more complex, dynamic, and volatile than perhaps any time in our history. Just a glance at the headlines today will point to efforts supporting our coalitions associated with Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and other hotspots around the globe. Additionally, Secretary of Defense Carter recently highlighted five challenges that are driving our defense planning efforts. The first two, Russia and China, reflect their desires for a, great, for a return to great power competition. Third and fourth are North Korea and Iran. And fifth is our ongoing fight to defeat terrorist activity. So I'll just say a few words about each set to stage. Russia poses an existential threat to the United States by virtue of the size of its nuclear arsenal. Russia desires to reemerge as a great power and as such clearly underpins the drive behind Mos Moscow's continued efforts to modernize both its conventional and its nuclear military programs. Russia has declared and at times has demonstrated its ability to escalate if required and is conducting destabilizing activities associated with Syria, Ukraine, and Crimea, while also violating treaties and other international accords and norms. Russia has also publicly stated that they are developing counterspace capabilities, and we have seen enough news of their malicious activities in cyberspace as Director Jim Clapper recently noted in the 2016 Worldwide Threat Assessment, quote, Russia is assuming a more assertive cyber posture based on its willingness to target critical infrastructure systems and conduct espionage operations, even when detected and under increased public scrutiny. We've witnessed China's attempts to advance its claims over disputed areas, as well as significant investments in their overarching military capabilities, including 
nuclear and conventional, to support their anti-access area of denial campaign and overall their quest for sovereignty. China is re-engineering its long-range ballistic missiles to carry multiple nuclear warheads, for example. It recently conducted another test of what we call a hyperglide vehicle and is pursuing conventional prompt global strike capabilities, offensive counter space technologies, and the exploitation of computer networks. Now these ac actions, when considered with its lack of transparency, raise questions about China's global aspirations. North Korea's actions are destabling and provocative and undermine peace and security in the broader region. Under Kim Jong-un, North Korea continues to heighten tensions by coupling troublesome statements, such as its claims of possessing miniaturized nuclear warheads and announcements of what it refers to as successful, this successful hydrogen bomb test that Mike mentioned here, along with developments in road mobile and submarine launch missile technologies. Now, most recently, North Korea, on the seventh of the month, uh, conducted a rocket launch, putting a satellite into space, continuing its efforts to develop and advance its long-range ballistic missile program. These actions are flagrant violations of United Nations Security Council mandates and demonstrates North Korea's lack of regard for regional stability and represents serious threats to our interests. Now, as Iran follows the mandates of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, we must be vigilant for any shift regarding nuclear weapons ambitions. Iran is developing ballistic missile programs and cyberspace capabilities, and their continued involvement in conflicts in the Middle East requires our attention. Finally, violent extremist organizations and terror groups are recruiting and operating across political, social, and cyberspace boundaries seeking to destroy our democratic way of life. Clearly, there's a lot going on around the world, and while I won't go through the array of other security concerns, the reality is that this strategic environment is increasingly complex. Unlike the bipolar world of the Cold War, today's multipolar world is more akin to a multiplayer concurrent and potentially intersecting games of chess that severely challenge the regional and global security dynamics. Future conflicts will not be contained within the prescribed borders, stovepipe domains, or segregated areas of responsibility. In other words, we must view future conflicts as transregional, multi-domain and multi-functional, and we must take a comprehensive approach to strategic deterrence, assurance, and escalation control. This is where U.S. Strategic Command comes into the picture. Now, U.S. Strategic Command is a functional combatant command, and it has trans-regional responsibility that extends from under the sea all the way up to geosynchronous orbit. I have those nine mission areas that uh, Mike Warner eloquently stated, so I won't repeat them here. But while those uh, nine, which are unified command plan assigned missions, may seem distinct and disconnected, when considered as a whole, they're actually complementary and synergistic. Having these missions under your strategic command is what allows us to address some of these global challenges and, of course, 21st century deterrence in a comprehensive and integrated manner. With that in context, I'd like to briefly go over my uh, priorities. As I describe this threat environment, I hope you see why deterring strategic attack against the United States and providing assurance to our allies is at the top of my priority list. That also requires the second priority to have a safe, secure, and effective strategic deterrent that's credible and ready. First, as you look at it, a strategic attack is one of the, those things that would have a devastating and catastrophic effect on a population. 
I think we all understand the strategic impact of a nuclear weapon, but it's also important that we understand what a similar attack would perhaps look like in space or cyberspace that could also have a strategic impact. Second, strategic deterrence capabilities are sometimes simply stated as the platforms or the weapons that compromise, that, com that are part of our visual triad, made up of ballistic missile submarines, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and of course, our nuclear capable B-2 and B-52 bombers. But the triad, however, is not enough. Often forgotten even are those tankers that have to refuel the, the bombers. They are a key asset. This critical capability en enables our bombers to carry out global missions, such as last, uh, earlier this month, uh, the, the B-52 flyover of the Republic of Korea, demonstrating our ironclad commitment to our allies in the Pacific. A safe, secure, and effective, and ready strategic deterrent requires, I would argue, the following. An appropriate intelligence and sensing apparatus to give us indications and warnings of incoming threats. Assured national nuclear command and control and communications. The necessary infrastructure to sustain and maintain reliable warheads. A credible missile defense system that defends against limited attacks from rogue nations, such as North Korea, and a resilient space and cyberspace architecture. We are a warfighting command. As such, my third priority focuses on delivering comprehensive warfighting solutions to effectively deter and assure and control the escalation of conflict in today's security environment. Threats must be looked across what I call the spectrum of conflict. Escalation may occur in varying degrees of intensity and more than one adversary can be involved and in multiple domains. We must also consider below threshold activities or those things we call in the gray zones that would not ordinarily propel the international community into action but must be carefully monitored as part of the larger site picture in which conflicts can grow and spill over and become out of control. At the end of the day, our actions and our capabilities must convince any adversary that they cannot escalate their way out of a failed conflict and that restraint is a much better option. As a country, we're growing increasingly dependent on space and cyberspace and so my fourth priority is to address the challenges in these domains by increasing our capability, our capacity, and of course our resiliency. If anyone remembers the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you might recall the description that space is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly and hugely mind-boggling big it is. Well, today, this characterization of space seems to be a bit amiss. The truth is, in relative terms, Earth-centric space is quite small. Once thought of as a sanctuary, the space domain has increasingly become contested, degraded, and operational limited. There are more than 60 nations operating in space today, and we can only expect that number to continue to grow. Similarly, we can expect an increase in the number of nations who wish to deny the peaceful use of space. Adversaries and potential adversaries are developing and in some cases demonstrating disruptive and destructive counter space capabilities. They are exploiting what they perceive as space vulnerabilities, threatening the vital national, civil, scientific, and economic benefits to the United States and the global community at large. This is particularly a concern to me as a commander responsible for space. And as you look to see how crucial space is to our foundational nuclear deterrent mission, in addition to my other assigned missions. So my space team at the Joint Space Operations Center at Vandenberg, California, detects and tracks 
more than 16,000 space objects. Last year, they confirmed more than 150 collision avoidance maneuvers, including four involving the International Space Station. They are also closely following North Korea's recent missile launch of a satellite and continue to monitor the status of these objects. Any collision or an attack in space could severely impact our ability to operate as a nation. To give you an example, just imagine the impact of the disruption of the global positioning system, the GPS constellation, would have on our day-to-day -day lives. While the inability to find your way to the nearest Starbucks might be of concern to some, the long-term consequences prove to be much, much more severe. The loss of accurate timing signals provided by that GPS constellation will impact our financial transactions and will slow the protocols that hold the internet together. It's not just our home and office networks that will be affected. The power grid, traffic lights, rail signals, water treatment plants, all are controlled by complex, intricate time networks. What about our military personnel in combat who rely on GPS or the drones and the GPS guided munitions we're using right now in our fight against ISIL. GPS is just one of the many systems that provide the vital capabilities to our country and others around the world. I think you get the point that the loss of our space capabilities will be problematic for both our military and our civilian infrastructures and know that U.S. Strategic Command is working hard to ensure we maintain our strategic advantage in space. Now, switching gears, similar to our reliance on space technology, cyber is essential to our network-centric way of life. As Americans, we depend upon modern technology. I'd argue probably many of you have one in your pocket or purse or what have you. The Internet of all things connects us in a ways that Many of us would never have imagined. Everything that makes modern economies possible relies on data and networks, all of which are vulnerable. Today's cyber threats are evolving at an unprecedented pace. The level of activity against our systems only continues to grow, and unfortunately, we're no longer just talking about that proud Chicago area native, albeit fictional character, Ferris Bueller changing his absences in the school computer, if you remember that movie. Cyber intrusion and intruders are hacking into household networks using electronics contained in everything from appliances to toys. Hackers are disrupting government networks and are attempting to deny services to thousands of industries daily. Highly advanced hacking tools, once only available to nation states and well-funded industrial espionage efforts, are now easily available, ironically, and in many cases online, to terrorists, activists, and organized criminals who are targeting our banking, healthcare systems, critical infrastructure, manufacturing, distribution, telecommunications, and retail networks. The internet is being used by terrorist organizations to recruit and indoctrinate others with their radical ideologies, as well as to gather, release, and exploit sensitive information about military people. As a commander for cyberspace operations, these trends, of course, are concerning. Admiral Mike Rogers, my uh, sub-unified commander for cyber manages these threats across the Department of Defense. Approximately 7 million networked devices and 15,000 network enclaves. He is closer to the fence than many in this area and he often says that one of his most challenging issues is creating a culture where the cyber security and cyber hygiene of computer system is as foundational as securing and protecting military-issued weapons. So we are working hard to increase what we call a culture of hygiene and personal responsibility. But as I often tell 
my workforce, we must all be cyber warriors and censors. Let me be clear, that is a censor with an S, not with a C. Although as a parent, I'm not opposed to being a cyber censor with a C either. As most are probably aware, the president recently released his national cyber security plan to help guide our long-term approach to cybersecurity. I'll highlight a few of the areas where U.S. Strategic Command is contributing. First, we are hiring qualified people and finding creative ways to increase their expertise. U.S. Cyber U.S. Strategic Command is working hard to build a cyber mission team force of some 6,000 strong but I recognize there is a global demand for these cyber skills. It is imperative we think innovatively about how to hedge those skill gaps, such as implementing internships and industry exchange programs and looking at where automation can replace human operators. As our Secretary of Defense might say, we need third offset strategies that can counter incoming cyber attacks faster than a human could. Second, we're making the defense of future networks a design priority. And we're strengthening our relationship between our Department of Defense and our private industry counterparts because we know we can't do this alone. Now this brings me to my fifth uh, priority, and that is building and sustaining and supporting partnerships. As a military component, we're working together with other combatant commands to synchronize our whole of government approach across the interagency and with our allies and partners, as well as with industry and academia. And that's why these types of forums are, in my opinion, so, so important. And my fifth and final priority is anticipating change and confronting uncertainty with agility and innovation. We, if we are to deter and detect strategic attack, whether it's nuclear, whether it's in space or cyberspace, we must think about these unthinkable scenarios through wargaming exercises and a deeper understanding of our adversaries. This means having the right people in the right jobs at the right time. It means investing in our workforce and encouraging the next generation of deep thinkers, engineers, physicists, mathematicians, and cyber experts. It means enabling individuals who are willing to stretch their minds beyond, well beyond, one-dimensional problems. In fact, after lunch, I'm excited because I'm going to get to travel to the Illinois Institute of Technology's idea shop, where I hope to learn about some of their innovative projects, many of which are important to the Department of Defense including the means to detect smuggled nuclear materials through our ports of entry. Now, one area I haven't touched on today is the budget. I know you are well aware of our current resource environment. While the President's budget for defense offers a balanced approach to national priorities and reduces some of the accumulated risks associated with modernizing U.S. Strategic Command mission areas, we cannot forget that our budget has a deterrent value of its own and reflects our nation's commitment to our deterrence strategy. If we are to meet future challenges, we must continue to invest in our nuclear deterrent forces, foundational intelligence, national nuclear command control and communications, space, cyberspace, missile defense, and personal development programs. To that end, budget stability is integral to strategic stability. In closing, let me say this. In this area of resource constraints, we must get 21st century deterrence right because we're dealing with a world where the international rules and norms are not always respected. While I painted a rather sober picture of the global landscape, I hope I've impressed you that our nation is working hard to avoid strategic conflict and to 
maintain strategic stability. If you take nothing else with you, know that we have stellar folks in our military today. I've traveled around to a number of the sites where folks work for me, places as close as Minot, North Dakota, and as far away as Alaska or Greenland and Australia. And I've witnessed personally their dedication, regardless of the environment we tasked them to go work in. And I'm proud of each and every one of them. Well, thanks again for hearing me out here in this formal part. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm eager to take your questions. Thank you. your remarks. We have time for some questions now. If you do have a question, please raise your arm and wait for a member of our staff to bring a microphone to you. Mr. Obenshane at that table, please. Thank you, Admiral, for your remarks. Uh, you talked about deterrence, and of course there's deterrence in terms of being ready and capable, having the assets for deterrence. There's also the actions. Could you maybe give us some insights into the debate or the discussions that go on at your level about when and, and where to take action. And I think of places like the South China Sea, East China Sea, cyberspace, Ukraine. Uh, you know, those are, you know, it's one thing to have the assets, it's another thing to, uh, to actually take some actions, not to use those assets necessarily, but to position them or to threaten to use them. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, when I look at uh, deterrence, uh, it's not, all military. Military is a part of it. A lot of times we dumb it down to what we call the dime, diplomacy, informational, military, and economics. And how do they all fuse together in terms of actions and being able to look one at the barometer over here and the trends, and then what are we doing about it in a variety of those different areas so that you don't just tromp in with a military operation when you have some other things going on. And that's why in order to balance deterrence, it's important that uh, from where I sit in my command that we are glued together across the interagency associated with things. So when we look at doing a military operation, we not only work with the uh, Department of Defense, but I really am always tuned in to make sure the State Department knows what we're gonna do. And depending on which country it's associated with, that particular country team, for example, is very important uh, uh, in, in that regard, as well as our intelligence collection uh, mechanism. Because in very simple engineering physics, uh, every action creates some type of reaction. So how do you ensure you've got that balance right? And as you look at the spectrum of a conflict or a conflict that's brewing, we really want to either deter successfully or de-escalate in terms we can live with. And that's a very intricate balancing act uh, on the strategic plane. And I would argue even below that on the operational and tactical plane. So that piece requires a lot of coordination planning and what have you associated with it. And in some cases, even though we would be doing something that we normally would be doing, a test associated with our capability or what have you, to make sure that the timing and tempo of that particular operation uh, is designed also to ensure we have the right effect across the uh, strategic environment, if so choose, chosen, or to not have it in terms of things as we do that particular balancing act. As we demonstrate that capability, uh, probably in my opinion, even before a demonstration, the perceived readiness of that capability is critical. Because when it comes to deterrence, it's all about perceptions. How does our adversary see uh, us and what we're doing or perceive what we're doing? And sometimes that perception is interesting too. The no secret to most of you in here that uh, as we look at working with uh, Russia today, of uh, the paranoia 
displayed associated with things like missile defense. And we know our missile defense in no way, shape, or form is designed or capable to take on their arsenal. But it's interesting the perception that exists there in terms of uh, where we have worked to establish capability in a variety of different areas, including the European phase adaptive approach. So this piece of perception management is, uh, to me, very hard sometimes to understand. This is why it requires a deep understanding of our adversaries. So when I hold a forum to do some digging in that area at US Strategic Command, I will not only have folks from our Defense Intelligence Agency or Central Intelligence Agency or our National Security Agency that's involved, but I'll bring in the uh, folks from the Department of State and their intelligence apparatus. I'll bring in uh, folks from Department of Treasury, because when we apply sanctions, again, there is a, that is part of a nation state strategic levers which they're uh, applying. And as we look at those, I want to be at least uh, ahead of the curve to understand are we getting to a significant point or not? And associated with that, what are my options that I can provide my boss, the Secretary of Defense, or the President if required? So I hope that answers your questions. Zach Weinberg. Oh, I'm sorry. You've got the control. Thanks, Admiral Haney. I was hoping you could expand a little bit more when you talked about partnerships, specifically how the ways industry is currently interfacing with U.S. Strategic Command and what innovations you're seeing in industry that could help uh, the de defense community. And tangentially, has that conversation changed in regards after the, the FBI and Apple controversy that's going on in the military realm? Uh, I would say, no, I'm, I'm quite frankly always pulling for more partnerships. And even in that latter case, making sure we understand each other uh, and why. That's so darn important in our country, uh, in the dem democratic values that we have so su subscribed to. Uh, but let me tell you partnerships and some of the areas that I'm really excited about. One in particular, and I'd love to have a Chicago higher level learning institution join us. But one of my goals has been to establish an academic alliance with a variety of different universities. Now clearly there in Nebraska we have some elite universities, University of Nebraska uh, system, uh, Creighton University for example. But uh, also, I was talking to Mike about his being an alumni of Stanford. Stanford is one that we uh, have an alliance with in Georgetown so that we can in fact have a broad base of thinkers that we can pull in to some of our forums. Sometimes we'll run a uh, tabletop exercise or what have you that involves those folks or a deterrent symposium. But more importantly to me is how those universities can be working to evaluate and think about strategic deterrence in the 21st century that's multi-domain, <coughs> multifunctional, uh, cross-regional, et cetera, in some sophisticated ways. I challenged him recently, you know, who, who, who's developing the next Henry Kissinger? Who I've spent, you know, I was pretty gracious uh, about a year ago where uh, he allowed me uh, a couple hours of his time to just sit down and brainstorm this complicated world and, and the thinking associated with it, and particularly where you are involved with an adversary that has weapons of mass destruction kind of capability. So having an academic alliance across the country is a, a, a appealing to me, and we've been working hard in that regard. If you even have one across the pond, the United Kingdom has, has got some interest in this, so I'm hoping this year we'll be able to even add one of our allies in that business. So it's very important in the partnership there. The other area, uh, we have a university affiliated research center, uh, the National Strategic Research Institute in the University of Nebraska that's run and it does a lot of work associated with uh, our countering weapons of mass destruction 
piece of partnership there. They also were good in uh, having uh, one of the few areas that study space law, uh, for example, and uh, are able to, uh, we are able to leverage that kind of capability. When I look at space, partnerships uh, include uh, working with the commercial industry so that we can share space situational awareness information and threat information with them. It's almost, you know, when you hear and talk about cyber and some of the Department of Defense efforts to, or our government efforts to support uh, our industry base as a whole uh, in space, similar except uh, the space situ awareness, situational awareness expands well beyond our borders. We have almost 10 uh, nations uh, that are involved, 60 some commercial entities uh, that are involved in terms of that piece uh, too, because it's very important. We want space to remain a peaceful environment. But we got to do that with teammates uh, in terms of things. So those are a couple of the areas. Uh, and even as I work now with what I call the Joint Interagency Combined Space Operations Center, JIGSPOT for short, there in Schriever Air Force Base, where we're doing some experimentation of uh, you know, how do we do the right sensing for uh, malicious activity in space, attribution, and then what do we do about it? and really running us some uh, experiments in that regard. But we're doing that, uh, of course, uh, even though we're involved with um, a lot of our intelligence apparatus and some of industry that helps us with those tool sets that we need in order to be able to track the dynamic movements in space, given the trends of where things are going in that area. Just to name a few. In regard to the development of the blockchain and the impact that that's going to have on the uh, inner um, exchange and transactions between banks in the East and the West, it's open source, it's decentralized. What kind of threats does this offer for the stability of the uh, American financial system? Now you called it blockchain, so give blockchain. them a Blockchain. 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 Mean to stump you, Block, if, if you'll pardon the informal amateur description of blockchain, uh, the informal amateur description of blockchain. This is an ongoing development. That's um, it's easily a hundred million dollars that various banks have invested in this uh, to develop a new form of exchange of value currency between banks. That's going to replace uh, the present system we have of currency. And it's, it's open source, which is something I'm not really sure that I fully understand. But what I think I understand is it's decentralized. And it means that uh, people who have the tech, uh, technical expertise can all contribute to the development of this. So this is a new system, which people who are investing millions of dollars in it say will be here within 10 years. So I'm curious what, what if anything, uh, this offers to the threat of the stability of the financial system in America. Well, I'm going to take that one as a lookup. <laughs> First off, I'll tell you what I know and what I don't know, and you've just exposed me, which is what I like about events like this. I always come back with something I didn't know and that I need to get some of the professionals to work with me on. So I won't waste your time giving you some anal extraction here. <laughs> I'll be a bit more professional and, and uh, really take that one uh, that I need to do a little more study. But I, I think uh, the real goodness of this question, though, is as we have changes that occur, uh, new approaches, et cetera, uh, how do we look at those squarely and evaluate them clearly with, uh, I like to call it wargaming, but to really understand the pros and cons associated with the approach and what will that look like 10, 25, 50 years from now in terms of things. So I, I think you're, you're right to be able to, you know, we need to look at things like that squarely in the face to understand. If, when you really think about it, as the internet came around in the beginnings, uh, it's, it's interesting in, in how that and globalization has changed the landscape so much. So interesting in the financial uh, business uh, that uh, this bear is clearly watching, and I can tell from your bio 
manners that uh, this is significant. The blue shirt at the back table, please. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much. Michael Santos, so I wanted to ask you about the Russian strategy of nuclear de-escalation that they issued in 1999. Seems to be a much larger concern of US war planners lately. And the overall issue of Russian tactical nukes, they appear to have a big advantage over us. So we have a very, very huge, very powerful strategic deterrent, but how do we extend that deterrence to deter the Russians from using tactical nukes, even in the battlefield, if they get into a fight, hopefully not, but with Turkey or with another NATO member or non-NATO member like Sweden, et cetera. And by the way, he was talking about bitcoins, the, the currency he was talking about. With the last question. Okay, um, the uh, Fitbits, was that the last part of your? No, 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 I'm sorry, forget about that, but he, but he was asking you with the last question, was okay. Bitcoins, the alternative Bitcoins, currency. okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, that I have heard. Well, that's part of it. Bitcoins are part of it, not the whole story. <laughs> but anyway, so I wanted to We're, we're going to glue you to the getter here. <laughs> with okay, so, no, I like the, oh, yeah. But uh, to your earlier point here, and this is an interesting piece, it, I have a hard time sometimes even seeing the word non-strategic nuclear weapons or tactical nukes because I say if we had one of them go off in the world, it's going to have a strategic effect and it's interesting how we label them. Uh, with that, uh, this is why in my opinion uh, the business of us being able to understand uh, Russia, Putin and their not just strategy, but their intent associated with it. And also, as we look at how here is a uh, country with an inter interesting economic trend, yet it's continuing and it has invested so heavily in terms of its nuclear arsenal at large, including its infrastructure that builds them in the first place, all the way to the platforms and what have you uh, uh, relative to things. The business, the cum cumulative fact here of, of things from the violations of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces in I INF Treaty, uh, for example, while uh, at the same time parading their capability around. I mean, just the number of long range strategic aircraft flights some very provocative, some without transponders on, et cetera, that you read about. That whole is a, a behavior, not a behavior you would want a rising power to be demonstrating uh, today. So when you say, well, Commander, what are you doing about it? Well, number one, uh, that's why I always talk about our deterrence as a whole in terms of things, our ability to understand moves before their moves and be able to apply some of our levels of power associated with this, very important. And that's why I don't like even using the nuclear triad word because strategic deterrence is that laundry list I gave you from foundational intelligence, the ability to stare down from space all the way to how we communicate is all part of that. Mr. Putin has to look across the pond and know that he doesn't want to escalate to de-escalate in that regard. He's got to look across Europe and know our commitment to things like Article 5 and those kind of things uh, relative to the business so that he doesn't go there in the first place. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the president has consistently said that he wants to close the prison at Guantanamo, um, and he's also moving toward normalization of relations with uh, uh, Cuba. Uh, the Cubans, I believe, have said that if you want complete normalization down the road, you're going to have to give up Guantanamo altogether. Is that something that you think that is in the cards? Would it harm our strategic interests? Uh, is that something we can do? I just thought uh, perhaps you could give us your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Better question for my good friend, Kurt Tidd, who's the commander of U.S. Southern Command, and uh, my other good friend, perhaps, uh, Admiral uh, Gortney, Northern Command. Not exactly in my 
spin of responsibility. So I'm not going to go there to give you a bunch of just Cecil Haney thought uh, relative to that piece. Yes, sir, on the side, please. When you look at the fact that our military has been actively engaged in military operations or military type operations for now 25 years, coupled with the uh, drawdown of our military for 26 years now, how does that pose certain budgetary restrictions or restraints that you're faced with from developing new strategic level concepts as you balance that with your compatriots across the uh, joint commands and the uh, services? It's a good question. Um, our military is extraordinarily busy today in so many parts of the globe in terms of things. So the whole uh, bartering of how we take and uh, split the forces for where we have them postured to what's our deployment rate uh, for our military forces has had quite a bit of st stress and strain for a long period of time as we've been in combat operations, uh, uh, in particular in the Middle East. That whole business of uh, resources versus operations versus preparing for the future is uh, always one of those kinds of uh, tensions that you may have that we experience. But uh, this is why things like this third offset is so important in terms of how do we continue to keep our approaches and technology ahead of adversaries who will want to take us on for the future. You can't ignore that piece, and I would argue you can't ignore a great power competition in, in that business because if you do, you may find yourself in a disadvantage uh, predicament. Uh, in the future. So that's why we have uh, what I call a very elaborate, intricate process by which we go through uh, working our way through what are we budgeting, what are we budgeting for uh, as we go through the business. The good news was here uh, that we were able to at least get through the Budget Act uh, fiscal year 16 and 17 with some clarity. Unlike when I was much younger where we had better clarity for more of a five-year piece, that becomes a bit more pro problematic when you're working to build things that are intricate. It takes multiple years to design, multiple years to produce and field and how you stay on course, keep industry on course, so that you can very efficiently and effectively capitalize on those types of synergy than every year coming in with a different story. You all know that from your business world, uh, pieces of how do you execute a strategy if the resources fluctuate significantly over time. So that requires us to have uh, a very deliberate process uh, fact base, get it on the table, look at trends and what have you so that we can hopefully have that balance right of what we need to do to confront the here and now and what we need to be ready for the future in terms of things. It is interesting when you look at the strategic arsenal that I have, I mean my hats are off to those engineers and scientists, et cetera, that developed this capability some time ago that we have managed to extend well, well, well past its design lifespan. We sometimes forget about that American ingenuity piece associated with that part. So as I sometimes am accosted at forums over, well, Commander, how can we afford to pay the bills associated with modernizing our nuclear forces? And is that relevant today? I would argue that uh, we have to be careful with that in that I would also say, can we afford not to when you look at what our adversaries are investing in and what have you. It was mentioned earlier, I have two grandsons. And uh, I would love them to have a more peaceful world when they 
as they grow up. But it is one that we have to work all those lovers diplomatically, informationally, militarily and economically to get that balance right going forward. And that's why I loved your question that had a financial ring to it because uh, as my team there at headquarters would tell you that uh, you know one of the first things I brought into the command was, hey, University of Nebraska, can I get one of your smart professors associated with economic trends to come in and talk to my leaders? Because I felt we've got to understand that piece, partially for the world piece, but also partially for our own budgetary piece as we work with the joint chairman Joint Chiefs and others in working to get that balance right that you eloquently talked about. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Please join me in thanking Admiral Cecil Hayes. <laughs>